We've reviewed a lot of them over the years. We've forged them in the fires. We've tried to kill them. And they've even tried to kill us. They're the 500. The cooler master cases that use the number 500 more specifically. And we have another one today. The cooler master TD500 mesh is a case that's supposed to sell for about $100. It's got three included front intake fans and it's got a mesh front. So that puts it in direct competition with the case that we marked as best overall and best airflow for 2019, the Fantex P400A RGB. This case is in about the right spot for the high airflow, good value segment of PC cases. But one thing Cooler Master has yet to master is its overwhelming instinct of using the number 500 on everything. The TD500 mesh is what we're reviewing today and we'll be benchmarking it for thermals, noise, and overall build quality. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Corsair Dark Core RGB Pro wireless mouse, which claims sub one millisecond wireless response, low latency Bluetooth, an 18,000 DPI sensor, a 2000 Hertz pulling rate, and interchangeable side grips. Corsair's mouse can charge on the MM1000 mouse pad with Qi charging, or it can be used wired. Learn more at the link in the description below. Apparently, Cooler Master has gotten tired of us constantly drilling holes in its cases to try and fix them, so this time, it's decided to just drill them in there for us. This case, like the P400A and like the NR600 before it, uses the ultra-fine mesh approach to a front panel. And that approach just means that you eliminate the need for a separate discrete dust filter in addition to larger holes mesh, like you'd find in an older case, like the half X, for example. So this approach is typically a pretty good one. And it's one that achieves very good airflow, obviously, but also good enough dust filtration. It's not quite as good as a separate filter plus the wider holes you'd find in more traditional older style mesh implementations. But if you just wipe this down once every month, it'll be fine. And the airflow is significantly improved as a result of this approach. Internally, the case is pretty simple. We've got three front fans in the stock configuration. They're mounted outside of the paneling. And we'll go over that in the build section written by Patrick in a moment. The back can have an exhaust fan. The one that's in here right now is one that we included for a separate test, so that is not included stock. And then the top, you've got options as well, obviously, with just a large magnetic standard dust filter. Very simple stuff for that. So appearances with this design were a top priority for Cooler Master. And for that reason, we're going to be going through areas where pennies have been pinched and a few have been saved and reinvested elsewhere in the case. So the chassis itself, the tooling, is designed with the intent of future reuse. You'll see this a lot in case manufacturing where tooling, so the physical tools required to make the case, costs hundreds of thousands of dollars for one version of a case. And that means that companies try to reuse that tooling for years and years. The P400A is a great example. That internal setup for the P400A feels ancient because it is. They've been using that for years now. And the same is true for a lot of the other cases on the market, like many of NDXT's H-series cases, where they reuse tooling, which isn't bad or evil. It's just a good way to get some extra mileage out of the internals. And then the paneling, the fans, all that stuff changes later on. So this one actually is built in a way where, if you look at it internally, it's got the, it's got the vestige of a five and a quarter inch bay for an optical drive but it's not fully implemented, so you can't put one in there, and obviously the front doesn't support it anyway. But Cooler Master is allowing for a future where that may be a possibility, especially for the Japanese market where Cooler Master sells a lot of cases that have five and a quarter drive support specifically for that market because the demand is higher. And so that's in here as an option for the future, but it's not an option for this version of the case. Let's go through the, the good and the bad areas where pennies have been saved and reinvested and then we'll talk about thermals after that. Tooling up for a fully new case is a huge expense, and we've shown factories of tooling back when we toured Deepcool's facilities in 2019 and Cooler Master's case manufacturing facilities around the same time. It's not cheap to do. Designing a chassis to be reusable then is a way to offset that expense. Just ask DIY PC and their Zonda O, which is a recurring, many times used chassis. Cooler Master has plans to make this one last a long time as well. But looking in closer at it, a few things that we noticed right away. One side of the hard drive cage underneath the power supply shroud is removable to make room for power cables if no three and a half inch drives are needed. But the other less important side of the cage is riveted. There are no USB-C ports built into the case. The bottom power supply filter is just a square mesh clipped into the case with no frame or handle. And none of the features are really 
all that fancy by modern marketing checkbox standards for marketing a case on Newegg. But they're also not deal breakers, although the power supply filter isn't good. But they're just indicators of the effort that it took to hit the $100 price point. Money saved elsewhere in the case went towards things like appearances, starting with the front panel. The fine metal mesh of the panel is shaped into facets similar to Fractal's Meshify cases, but they're symmetrical rather than random. It's clearly inspired, in the very least, by Fractal's design, if not just straight up lifted from it. The mesh is painted a light gray, and it blocks different amounts of light from the three ARGB front fans at different angles, creating an interesting effect. The top filter is the same shade of gray, but it doesn't always look like it, since the large holes in the filter leave the black and white interior of the case visible unless viewed at a steep angle. Even the power supply filter we criticized earlier is made of white mesh to match the chassis. The faceted design extends to the white plastic frame of the panel, which in turn lines up with a pattern pressed into the tempered glass side panel. Cooler Master continues to pioneer new ways to work with tempered glass, a material that's notoriously difficult to work with for its propensity to shatter. We showed some of these efforts when we toured Cooler Master's third-party glass supplier, a company which allowed us to film nearly every single process in the factory except those related to custom glass bending and other such specialized techniques. The TD500's glass panel and design on it must be significant as a part of the cost of the case, or at least as part of the case, so it's a pity that the design doesn't quite line up as it should with the front panel. The front panel is like that of Fantex P400A, in that it has no additional filter layer, just mesh and nothing else. This, if executed properly, is the approach that we prefer. One layer of ultra-fine filtration will inevitably let more dust through than two layers, but doing normal system maintenance is a small price to pay for good cooling. Wipe the front down once you start seeing dust build up and it'll be fine. The panel itself is lightweight and thin to the point of being almost fragile. It's easy enough to take off. So that's another trade-off you get here. It takes a little more care to line it up and snap it back into place without any unwanted warping. The way the plastic frame appears to wrap around the mesh like a loose hood is an intentional illusion. And the mesh is in fact flush with the frame around the edges, leaving no air gaps. Side panel mounting is adequate, but again, indicative of cost savings. The steel side panel is the same age-old design that hooks on with metal tabs and takes four arms to keep all the edges pressed down while sliding it into place. At least the thumb screws are captive. The two thumb screws on the glass panel are captive as well, which is a neat trick to pull off with the screw that goes through glass. At the bottom edge, the panel is held into place with a metal strip adhered to the glass, which allows the panel to hinge out a little from the body of the case without falling off. It's a good balance between inexpensive and still functional. One aesthetic choice that we're conflicted on is the use of plastic pins rather than normal fan screws to hold the bottom most front fan in. The fans are all attached to the outside of the metal chassis, meaning that the fans are screwed into place from the inside, meaning that it's difficult to screw the lowest fan into place without a very short screwdriver that can clear the power supply shroud. As an alternative to this problem, Cooler Master chose to attach the bottom fans with pins inserted from the outside of the case. The major advantage of using pins instead of long radiator screws, as they've done in the past with H500 cases, is that the pins can be colored white and can be blended in with the white chassis and the white fan, making them effectively invisible through the front panel. This is a good detail, and we can appreciate the thought that Cooler Master has put into this very fine aspect in its uh, catalog of attention to detail items for the case. Unfortunately, there are disadvantages as well. Firstly, the plastic pins are tricky to put back into place and are not quite as tight as normal screws would be. Secondly, the pins Cooler Master uses are slightly smaller in diameter than fan screws, so their mounting holes are also smaller, meaning that some of the holes in the front panel are just slightly too small for actual fan screws, despite being used to screw in fans. There are correctly sized holes right next to them, but come on now. RGB and ARGB are very low on our list of priorities for PC cases, but we've become intimately familiar with some of the frustrations of ARGB as a result of our recent Cyberpunk 2077 case mod. Cooler Master's 3-pin ARGB headers may be physically the same as the 3-pin headers that ASUS, MSI, ASRock, and other companies have settled on, but they're not electrically compatible. Corsairs should be at least as far as we can tell. 
but they use a proprietary connector just to annoy everyone else, and NTXC's 4-pin ARGB headers are another frustration entirely. The one uniting factor among all competing RGB systems is that the software sucks. It's garbage. NTXC's CAM is one of the most usable interfaces, and given our opinions on CAM, that's saying something. We mention this because Cooler Master has gone out of its way to make the TD500 mesh's lighting effects widely compatible. The control cables include a converter module that takes two common types of ARGB headers and splits them into three Cooler Master headers for the three front fans. There's also an optional dongle with baked in lighting patterns that can be hooked up to the reset button for lighting effects completely independent of software. We received one of these with an in-win case some time ago, and it's been extraordinarily useful for controlling ARGB lighting effects without building an entire PC and installing terrible bloatware. The included fans aren't particularly fast for 120mm, topping out at 1200 RPM to about 1300 RPM. There's always a plus or minus 10% variance, but they are ARGB. For us, the most important feature is that Cooler Master separates out the fan headers into a normal three pin header and a separate LED connector, rather than mashing them together into some unusable proprietary mess. Despite the narrow appearance of the front panel, it does actually support 140mm fans, even mounted to the outside of the chassis inside the front panel. For better or worse, Cooler Master has gone to lengths to minimize the holes and the black marks that might be visible through the front panel. The cutouts in the front of the chassis are three 120mm circles, and there are exactly two sets of mounting holes for 140mm fans. One is in the middle of the panel, and one is at the bottom of the panel. It's unlikely users will want to replace or move the stock ARGB fans, but it could easily be more flexible. Claimed radiator support for the front of the case is up to 360mm, but we'd say it's more like 240mm max, since both 360 and 280 radiators would fall below the level of the power supply shroud and make tube routing difficult. Remember, closed loop liquid cooler radiators should be oriented with tubes down to prevent serious pump wine issues later and to prevent dry out of the pump. Radiator support at the top of the case is better with 120 mil and 140 mil mounts extending the whole length of the case. Clearance from the top edge of the motherboard to the top of the case is just three centimeters, but the radiator and fan mounts are offset a bit towards the side of the case away from the motherboard. The distance from the motherboard tray to the 140 mil mounting location is approximately four centimeters. And that makes the distance to the 120 mil mounting location approximately six centimeters. Cooler Master says motherboard support goes up to 12 inches by 10.7 inches and quote, will limit cable management features if you're using a board that size. It also uses the mostly entirely meaningless term EATX, which you can watch a different video on, but they hedge this by using the more specific term SSI CEB as well, which we're fine with. In fact, there's nothing to stop much wider boards from being installed other than a lack of cable cutouts and threaded holes for standoffs. The motherboard tray is flat and open across the whole 13 inch width of the true EEB motherboard sizing, and this case could support one with some modding. Kale management space is tight behind the motherboard tray. Cooler Master lists clearance as 1.9 millimeters, but that's the maximum depth. And in some locations, clearance shrinks towards 1.5 millimeters. The tie points next to the cable cutouts and the space under the power supply shroud make management possible. But the small amount of clearance combined with the already difficult to wrangle steel side panel aren't fun to deal with. The listed specs for drive mounting are somewhat misleading. For 2.5 inch drives, Cooler Master has included a set of rubber stoppers and metal posts that allow the drives to be pressed into place without being screwed down. We've seen this system in past cases and we like it. The misleading part though, is that the spec sheet implies that there are only two 2.5 inch mounting locations outside of the hard drive cage. But what it actually means is that there are only two sets of stoppers and posts. There are four mounting locations, two on top of the shroud and two behind the motherboard tray. We did our standard test suite for the TD500 mesh, which has grown to include a 100% load torture test, one CPU exclusive blender, render test, one GPU accelerated one, a Firestrike Extreme stress test to stand in for gaming workloads, and three further torture tests, including uh, now an extra one test with the front panel removed, one with the stock fans normalized to 36 dBA, for the noise threshold, and one using a standardized set of fans to replace the stock fans. This time, we did one extra torture test as well, with the stock layout of the case, plus a cheap 120mm fan added to the rear exhaust for 
a mount in an air-cooled configuration. For the standardized fan test, we mounted the two 140mm intake fans to the inside of the chassis as dictated in the manual, in contrast to the stock fans, which are mounted to the outside of the chassis. We'll start the case torture thermals with just the Cooler Master TD500 mesh and some other immediately relevant comparisons, like some meshify cases. Baseline CPU temperature in the torture test was 51 degrees Celsius delta T over ambient, promisingly close to the average CPU DT of 46C with no front panel. Adding an extra exhaust fan behind the CPU cooler may have helped a little bit, with a resulting CPU DT of 50 degrees Celsius, again over ambient, but the unrounded temperature averages are within one degree of each other, which at that point, we generally consider that to be margin of error or test variance. This is a good start for the TD500 mesh though. If adding an exhaust fan doesn't really help this configuration, and if even taking the front panel off only reduces temperatures by four to five degrees, it indicates that the stock fan configuration is close to optimal for an air cooler setup. For reference, the Magic IC really needs some fans to be any good. It's capable, as illustrated by the configuration with two 140mm Noctua front fans, but its stock performance at 54C drags behind as a result of the bare bones approach. That's fine, as long as the buyer is aware that just mesh isn't good enough alone. Compared to the rest of our chart, a 51 degrees Celsius over ambient result for stock positions the TD500 mesh where it should be, alongside the half X, the Define S2 Meshify, and the 220T airflow. Our most exceptional cases usually score in the 47 to 48 degrees Celsius delta T over ambient range, so this falls just short of that. That range of exceptional performers includes things like the P400A RGB, measuring at 48 degrees Celsius over ambient, and Be Quiet's 500DX, measured at 49. Cooler Master's case may not exceed the others in this category, but all three cases mentioned are very well cooled with stock fans that can take advantage of the panel designs. GPU torture results are next, again starting with only the TD500 and the Mesh of IC, and then adding the others later. GPU temperature in the same test as previously is 50 degrees Celsius over ambient, which dropped to 47C with front panel removed. Adding an exhaust fan didn't hurt, but the average temperature remained within margin of error of the stock result, rounding to about 50C. We frequently run into scenarios where stock case configurations allow the GPU to pull air in through empty PCIe slots, meaning that adding fans to force a more normal airflow pattern often ends up hurting GPU thermals. That's not the case here though, and it wasn't with the P400A RGB either, which we'll look at in a moment, since both have stock configurations which push air directly from the front of the case to the back. As for the Mesh of IC, it's decidedly behind in this set of tests because we're looking at a one-off where we added two 140 mil fans. More fully populating the front of the case would help its performance a bit more. We have to truncate our 270 or so rows of data to fit into a video, so this chart is the shorter list. 50 degrees Celsius is a more favorable temperature over ambient for the GPU in the comparative sense. The TD500 mesh is still a bit warmer than the P400A RGB at 49 degrees Celsius over ambient for that, but it beats the 500DX's average of 52 degrees Celsius over ambient in this test. There's no secret technique to these temperatures. The case has a vent in the front and only one layer, and Cooler Master stuck a bunch of fans behind that vent. Sometimes that's all it takes. The 220T also ends up behind the TD500, and as for Cooler Master's other 500 named cases, the H500 blank mesh, the one that launched at about $100 originally, is at 48.5 degrees Celsius. So it's ahead of the TD500, but we wish our editors luck in finding the right 500 to highlight here. Our first blender test is with a CPU only render. This marked CPU temperature at 37 degrees Celsius over ambient tying it with the P400A RGB, and putting it a degree above the 500DX's 36 degrees Celsius average. At this point, this result functions mostly as a sanity check for the torture test results. There are only so many ways we can point out that it's a well-ventilated case, but this is one where we only have load on the CPU, realistically, so it gives you a look at a different type of workload. And now we can shift it to the GPU only instead. GPU temperature reached 22 degrees over ambient here, and this ties it with the SL600M and the Lian Li 011XL for best GPU temperature overall on the whole chart. Both of these were tested with bottom intake fans pointed directly into the GPU, so it makes sense that they would be among the chart leaders. And without the full system load of the torture test, GPU cooling is especially good, which is promising for the Firestrike Extreme result. Firestrike is next, our gaming stand-in. The TD500 mesh isn't at the absolute top of the chart here, 
but it's pretty close. 49 degrees Celsius DT ties it with the P400A mesh and gets it pretty close to the O11XL again, although the larger temperature range reveals the SL600M's advantage with an average of 46 degrees Celsius over ambient. The 500DX averaged 53 degrees Celsius over ambient in this test, giving the TD500 mesh a slightly larger advantage than it had in the torture results. The standardized fan test is most useful in cases that only come with a few fans, since there it allows us to see how a case will perform against others when it has a more proper allocation of fans added. Its utility is limited here, and this is one of the many pitfalls of standardized fan testing that viewers always really want to see, but as we described in our introduction piece of this methodology, there are a lot of flaws to it. Still, we added it by popular demand. Either way, it's unlikely people buying the TD500 mesh are doing so with the intention of replacing those ARGB front fans. CPU DT averaged 52 degrees Celsius, a couple degrees warmer than the stock result, which makes sense since the 140 mil intake fans we installed could only be mounted at the bottom of the front panel below the CPU level. That's a mediocre result, on par with the H710 or the Bit Phoenix Nova Mesh, which just highlights how important the three stock fans are. They aren't the best fans in the world, but they're a significant part of the value of the case, and it makes no sense to pay for them and then replace them. GPU DT OS 47C, a few degrees below baseline, again because we were forced to mount the fans as low as possible in the case by the lack of mounting locations physically. This is a much more competitive result, comparable to the Lian Li O11XL with bottom intake fans and significantly cooler than the 500DX and P400A RGB. But our point still stands. The stock fans are a large part of the reason for buying this case. Either use them or find a cheaper case that doesn't come with fans and supply your own. You'll save some money. With all the stock fans at 100% speed, around 1200 to 1300 RPM, we recorded a noise level of 39.7 dBA. This isn't audibly louder than the P400A's noise level of the 38.6 dBA result at 20 inches distance, but that's enough of a difference that the TD500 mesh may need a steeper fan speed reduction to hit our noise normalized threshold. We noise normalized the stock fans to a threshold of 36 dBA for this test, which for the TD500 mesh meant setting the case fans to 75% speed for a reported speed of just over 1000 RPM, which works out to basically the same percent or RPM reduction as the P400A required. CPU temperature with this fan speed rounded to 56 degrees Celsius, definitely warmer than baseline, but still under control. This puts it between the NR600 and the Mesh C in performance, but well behind the P400A's 51 degrees Celsius average. This is still good performance, slightly cooler than the Mesh C's average, but it seems that the Cooler Master case doesn't excel with CPU temperatures at this noise level in the same way that the 500DX and the P400A do, and that comes down mostly to a question of static pressure performance. Here's the same chart except sorted by GPU temperature. The GPU averaged 52 degrees Celsius in this test with the TD500 mesh, keeping with the trend of more favorable GPU temperatures than CPU temperatures. Here, the TD500 beats everything except the Lian Li O11XL and Zonda O, both of which have direct GPU cooling, and it ties the P400A RGB. The 500DX falls behind with an average of 54 degrees Celsius over ambient. Given that Cooler Master's case ties the P400A for GPU thermals and was beaten by it for CPU thermals in this test, the P400A technically wins, in a sense, but the TD500 mesh's overall performance is strong here, and ultimately that level of difference doesn't really matter all that much. This confirms the idea that a sealed off case will be outperformed by a mesh fronted case, if you didn't already know that, with the fans turned down to reach the same noise level. The TD500 is one of the better cases in this price point, and this price point actually is starting to get really exciting right now because there's finally a lot of good cases where they're all plus or minus about $10 from each other. Fantax P400A, we've mentioned a lot at this point because it's been a, a chart leader, especially at the price, and it's also been rarely in stock. A lot of people are buying it. The Be Quiet 500DX, the new one with the sort of Lian Li Land Cool inspired front, that's another case that performed very well at this price point. It's not quite as competitive thermally as some cases, but Be Quiet took a different approach to design and still managed to execute well thermally, which is uncommon to find, unfortunately. So you have a lot of really good choices in this price category. We'd be completely fine if we were in the market for a $100 case. Personally, I'd be fine buying the P400A, the TD500, the Be Quiet 500DX, or if you stretch the budget a bit, you can maybe go Lian Li O11, but now you're talking about buying fans as well. So plenty of good options. 
Uh, there's not necessarily a right choice. Most of these do have some sort of looks flair to them. So they're, it's, it's exciting because the approaches these three different companies have taken, Cooler Master, Be Quiet, and Fantex, shows that it's possible to make a mesh-fronted fairly well to very well, depending on which, ventilated case that is capable of breathing but also having some visual flair to it. So you don't have to have just a flat mesh panel, a bunch of holes in the front of every case. They don't all have to be rectangles with holes in the front. There's obviously other ways to do it. The O11 Dynamic, as example, the side intake, it performs very well if you have good fans in there. And this one does well. The Be Quiet gives you a different look. So what we'd say is if you're looking for a straight performance per dollar competition, a showdown in thermal performance only, especially with an air-cooled system, obviously the thermals change a little bit, but they, the hierarchy mostly remains the same if you change the coolers. If you're looking at a showdown head-to-head, -head, the Fantax P400A technically has a victory. It wins in terms of best thermals just straight up versus the TD500 and the P400A. And it'd be specifically P400A-D, the ARGB one, that you'd want to buy in that instance. And that's $90 right now, so it also has a, a bit of a financial advantage too. But ultimately, you're talking differences at this point that are mostly margin of error. And then you should just buy whatever you think looks best for your build. The other key difference we'd point out is that the P400 is a very old chassis. It's been around a long time. The tooling is ancient, and it feels pretty old to build in. This one is, in terms of build quality, personally, I'd rank it a bit higher than the P400A's internal build quality, the ease of installation, but they're not that different. So buy whichever one you think looks best. Uh, TD500 mesh did well overall. It is within margin for the most part of some of the other performers among the top in its price category. So that's it for this one. Job well done, Cooler Master, for putting out a case that uh, yet again performs well thermally. They've really turned it around over the last few years. So we are happy to see them continue to do that, go that direction with their cases. As always, you can support us directly at store.gamersnexus.net by picking up things like a mouse mat or a mod mat, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to get access to our new behind the scenes video. We posted one last week, and we're posting one again in a few days. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.